On behalf of the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention and the National Institute of Justice, welcome to the National Gang Center's Interrupting the Cycle of Violence webinar series. We begin this first webinar with insights from the Urban Institute's research-based practice guidance to reduce youth gun and gang violence or group violence. As a reminder, the National Gang Center is supported by the United States Department of Justice of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention. The opinions, findings, and conclusions of the moderator, the presenters, and the panelists are our own. The National Gang Center exists to help communities implement comprehensive solutions to prevent youth and street gang violence, reduce gang involvement, and suppress gang-related crime. For more information about the Gang Center, we recommend visiting our website at nationalgangcenter.ojp.gov. My name is Mina Harris. I serve as the director of the National Gang Center and the executive vice president of the Institute for Intergovernmental Research. I will be serving as your moderator for the webinar today. First, before we begin the presentation, it is my pleasure to introduce you to Phelan Weirich, Senior Policy Advisor with the U.S. Department of Justice Office of Justice Programs. Phelan? Thank you, Mina. It is an honor for me to be here today and to speak to all of you who have assembled to hear this webinar. You're here because you share a strong interest in, and maybe even a passion for working to prevent and reduce violence and to save lives and to help build more healthy communities. In this webinar, you will, you will receive information that will help you do just that because this webinar is built on a synthesis of some of the best knowledge and evidence that we have been able to collect. We know that across our nation, there are certain communities that experience much higher levels of violence than most. We know that violence has increased in many of these communities recently, but regardless of whether national trends show that crime is decreasing or increasing, we see consistent patterns where these same communities continue to struggle with elevated levels of violence. This violence is both the result and the cause of many problems and challenges. For example, we know that exposure to violence as a victim or a witness can cause trauma in children, families, and whole communities. This trauma in turn contributes to a wide range of negative consequences. Children who have been exposed to violence are more prone to school failure and dropout. They are more likely to experience mental illness as well as behavioral and emotional problems. They are more likely to become engaged in substance abuse. They are more likely to experience uh, repeated victimization. And yes, they are more likely to become involved in delinquency, violence, and criminal behavior during adolescence and into adulthood. They're more likely to become involved in gangs, which itself is a risk factor for further exposure to violence, victimization, and perpetration of violence. And they're more likely to become involved in juvenile and criminal justice systems. And these same communities where this violence is more likely to, to occur are also more likely to lack the services and resources that could help these young people and their families. There are people who believe that these communities will never change, that these are problems that cannot be solved. I don't believe that. And I don't think you believe that, or you probably wouldn't be here watching this webinar. We don't believe it in part because there is evidence to the contrary. We're going to hear about some of that evidence today. You're gonna to hear from experts who are working and succeeding in addressing these challenges every day. But even though I'm a researcher, I'm quick to tell you that evidence is not enough. Beyond evidence, we need passion and political will and resources. And I'm here to tell you that I see those things coming together now more than at any other time in my quarter century of doing this work. Let's start with the passion and commitment that is coming from the impact communities themselves. Those with lived experience in these communities 
are doing the difficult and sometimes dangerous work of directly engaging with those who are most likely to be involved in violence and providing support and services to those folks. At the same time, community-based organizations and local governments are building partnerships that are helping to bring services to those most in need. On top of all of that, they're making great strides in advocating for more resources to support community violence intervention and prevention efforts across the nation. Not just to support these programs, but to build community violence intervention strategies into an essential piece of our public safety infrastructure in this country. This advocacy and passion has helped to inform the Biden administration's strong support for community violence intervention strategies as a key component within the White House comprehensive strategy to combat gun violence and other violent crime. The Department of Justice also highlights the importance of investing in community-based violence prevention and intervention programs within DOJ's comprehensive strategy for reducing violent crime. This year, Congress has also stepped up to make $50 million available for the Community Violence Intervention and Prevention Initiative. Just last week, the Office of Justice Programs released two solicitations that describe how funding initiatives support planning, implementation, and expansion or enhancement of strategies. There is also funding for training and technical assistance and program evaluation. Grant applications must be submitted no later than June 21st. And the solicitations for, these, for this initiative can be found on the OJP website under current funding opportunities. Again, that's the Office of Justice Programs website under current funding opportunities. These solicitations reflect the coordinated efforts of multiple components within OJP. I wanna commend the collaborative work of the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention, the Bureau of Justice Assistance, the Office for Victims of Crime, and the National Institute of Justice. All are involved in supporting this important initiative. We are also in ongoing communication and coordination with other federal partners in the, Department of, in the Departments of Health and Human Services, Education, Labor, Treasury, HUD, and others. We're working closely with the White House. I can assure you there's much more to come on this topic of community violence intervention. We're excited about our work and it's really just beginning. I'll bring my remarks to a close by sharing another opportunity to be involved in, in, in this work. OJP relies on external experts to help us carry out peer reviews and uh, of all the applications that we receive. And you could be one of those experts. We're actively looking and working to increase our capacity and uh, expand our pool of eligible peer reviewers. Being a peer reviewer is a great opportunity to learn more about what's happening in the field and contribute your knowledge to our decision making. Really, and to help us ensure that federal resources are being wisely used to reduce violence in communities across the country. So, for more information based on peer reviewer, again, again please, please visit the OJP's website, that is the Office of Justice Programs website, and look for information about becoming an OJP peer reviewer. Thank you so much for all the work that you do. I want to thank the National Gang Center, the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention, and the National Institute of Justice for giving me the opportunity to share these remarks. I hope you enjoy the webinar. Thank you so much, Valen. We'll put the, um, the link to the peer review uh, opportunities in the chat as well. Um, I had some comments. I think you just, I think you just, um, addressed it so well and you, and you summarize it so well, the issues of community violence and youth violence. And we know that this affects us all. And I, and I don't want to rehash what you just said, but I will say that the urgency with which we must redouble our efforts to, to, 
which we must redouble our efforts may lead to some may lead some to rush into action from a scattered approach. And I think this is what you were getting at. This practice guidance is intended to provide an intentional pathway to effectively reducing youth gun and gang violence. So during this session, oh, we're gonna address some uh, webinar objectives now. During this session, we will begin with the presentation that summarizes the Urban Institute's uh, research-based project and guidance that was developed as an outcome of their efforts. Then to further demonstrate how the practice guidance is relevant to different stakeholder groups, we'll follow the presentation with a practitioner-led panel discussion. I will introduce our, our panel guests at that time. Now, let me introduce our esteemed Urban Institute guests. Jesse Janetta is a senior policy fellow in the Urban Institute's Justice Policy Center. He heads projects on community anti-violence initiatives, police community relations, parole and probation supervision, and prison and jail reentry, including complex multi-method process and outcome evaluations. He is co-principal investigator of the Developing Research-Based Practice Guide to Prevent Youth Gun and Gang Violence Project. Lee Courtney is a senior policy associate in the Justice Policy Center at the Urban Institute, where she works primarily on issues related to mass incarceration and criminal justice reform. Before joining Urban, Courtney led performance measure development and data analysis at CSR Incorporated on behalf of the Office of Victims of Crime. So Courtney, I believe you're, um, excuse me, Lee, <laughs> I believe you are um, uh, kicking it off. That's right. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much, Mina, for that kind introduction. Um, thank you very much to the National Gang Center for organizing this event. I know Jesse and I are both very excited about the chance to share this work uh, and engage with folks working directly on these issues out in the field. So to begin, um, I'll just give you a sense of what we'll cover today. I'll start with an overview of the project, a little bit of information about how we organize the study. Jesse will then uh, work with me to share some of the details on how we arrived at the recommendations that are in the practice guide, which is the focus of this presentation. Um, the, those activities included a liter literature synthesis and a scan of practice. Then I'll go ahead and hand it over to Jesse and he'll walk through the key, ta key takeaways uh, that we translated into the guide uh, for folks looking to implement violence reduction strategies. So the Urban Institute received funding from NIJ and OJJP in 2018 to produce a research-based practice guide on implementing new approaches and refining existing strategies to reduce youth gun violence connected to gangs or groups. Uh, there were three prongs to our scope. Uh, we focused on strategies that aim to reduce gun-related violence uh, that was committed by young people between the ages of 10 and 25 who may be also associated with gangs and groups. Um, and the key audience that we uh, oriented this practice guide towards was um, local government leadership, including mayors, county executives, county commissioners, youth violence reduction task forces, et cetera, um, thinking basically that those decisions are the ones that often greatly influence whether violence reduction practices um, are successfully implemented and sustained in the long term. Although I do want to say that even though that was kind of how we framed the findings in our report with that audience in mind, we are absolutely hoping that these findings are going to be useful to uh, a broader uh, range of stakeholders, including community-based organizations, serving youth and young adults, uh, other community stakeholders and policymakers, as well as researchers as well. Um, before moving on, I just wanted to share some framing around the language that we use in this report, as well as this presentation. I want to recognize that there's not a universal definition of the term gang used throughout the field. Um, we approach the use of the word gang with caution because out of our interviews with practitioners, um, they surface some concerns about detrimental and labeling as aspects of that word, including very real impacts like being included in gang databases. So with that in mind, um, we use the term group uh, either instead of or in addition to the term gang. We do use the term gang though when we're referring to specific interventions or um, areas of research and practice that are oriented towards this like OJJDP's comprehensive gang model. 
So as I mentioned before, the guidance and the practice guide that Jesse's going to talk to us about today is based on two components of our uh, overall study, which was a, a literature synthesis and a scan of practice. Starting with the literature synthesis, our main goal here really was to review um, research evidence on the efficacy of youth gun and group violence interventions. And that included looking at details on how, what types of strategies were employed, um, the efficacy of those and any barriers or facilitators of success. Um, we do know though that there's very wide variation in how these inter interventions are implemented across sites. Uh, even if they share the same name, theory of change or problem analyses, um, that can have very different uh, implications on uh, kind of how we interpret research around their efficacy. So we did also uh, include a focus on how programs were Im implemented and how that might have affected their success and su sustainability. So emerging from the literature really were three prominent models. Um, we know initiatives to address youth group and gun violence are extremely complex and can be very difficult to categorize and assess. Um, we found that many, although not all, interventions um, that have been evaluated and appear in the research literature can be categorized within one of three major models, um, focused deterrence, public health, and the Spurgle or OJJDP comprehensive gang model. Um, we use these terms in this presentation and in the brief really as a shorthand for organizing the interventions in the published literature, realizing that you know this definitely does mask some variation in how they're implemented. So the chart here just gives an overview of our synthesis findings at a glance. Uh, I would welcome you to check out our reports if you'd like more details. This is very, very high level. Um, but just to walk through kind of the overall findings here, uh, in terms of how we're thinking about focused deterrence and how this showed up in the literature, these are typically interventions that presume that youth group and gun violence will stop if individuals in those groups believe the likelihood of getting caught is high and the punishment will be severe, typically targets a specific and identifiable group of people. Um, these constituted over 37% of the interventions that we covered in our coded analysis. Um, it was also the most commonly mentioned model in the literature synthesis that we reviewed. Um, in terms of findings, uh, the majority of these focused deterrence interventions had mixed results for the outcomes, but most demonstrated at least one positive outcome. And I'll, I'll note that most results were mixed because the interventions had some statistically significant positive results and some that were not statistically significant. Um, as I mentioned, we really did want to have a, a focus on implementation uh, in the study. And so we reviewed the literature to try to learn some lessons about implementation um, challenges as well as successes. One challenge that came up was um, on a recurring basis was being able to conduct sufficiently thorough um, local problem analyses before developing responses. Um, just noting that practitioners really need to be strategic about setting their goals and creating actionable plans that are realistic um, and effectively messaged to communities. Um, these interventions can also be a bit challenging to replicate. Um, they might not work equally well in every community, which I think speaks again to the importance of local problem analyses. Um, and in terms of sustainability, um, we found that practitioners really need to proactively develop plans to keep those on track for the long term um, and consistently monitoring and reevaluating interventions can help with that. Um, shifting to a focus on uh, public health interventions, these typically understand violence as a public health problem requiring a multi-layered solution focused not just on individual people, but also on kind of broader societal factors that influence their behavior. Um, these operate outside of law enforcement and don't include a threat of punishment via law en enforcement. Um, these constituted 33% of the interventions uh, that we coded in terms of original studies. It was also the least commonly mentioned uh, model in the literature reviews that we analyzed, um, possibly because it's just a more recent approach to violence reduction. Um, these main activities are kind of focused on providing individual services and disrupting conflicts to stop violence. Um, in terms of our findings, again, similarly, most results were mixed because of some statistically significant positive results, some that were not, uh, none showed negative results. In terms of implementation, um, we found that it's very important for stakeholders to clearly define who is most at risk of committing or experiencing violence um, and prioritize those people in these interventions. Um, engaging them as partners is also really essential for productive relationships and helps create long-term changes. Um, and then in terms of the comprehensive gang model, um, this we characterized as a, a really data-driven and strategic response um, that's designed to change youth behavior to reduce um, 
gang-related violence, especially in neighborhoods with high incidences of gang-related violence. Um, it's a very data-driven and adaptive framework that's based on local problem assessment. Um, also very much centers on collaboration across stakeholders. And these made up 22% uh, of the interventions in the original studies that we included. Um, the results were also mixed slightly due to challenges that stakeholders uh, had in implementing the model. Um, but again, some statistically significant, uh, some indicated no change. Um, in terms of implementation findings, this model really does require significant collaboration and commitment from stakeholders, and that can be one of the biggest hurdles in implementing it. Um, and the success really does rely on communities' ability to individualize their approaches and make sure that practitioners have adequate time to implement uh, this complex model and reach the populations that they're aiming for. Um, moving on. Uh, I will note, uh, although the names of those three models appear quite often in the literature, um, there is, again, huge variation in how they're implemented. We know that programs don't always fit cleanly into one of these models, um, and many of them are actually a hybrid of these models. Um, and, and interventions that are meant to emulate one model might ultimately be implemented in a very different way. So with that in mind, uh, we also looked to uh, specific activities employed across the models to get a better understanding of what was actually um, done under these umbrellas. Um, so to the extent possible, our, our guidance in the practice guide really does focus more on highlighting effective activities rather than one of those three models um, in terms of what you know, should be replicated. Um, and so this chart here just summarizes intervention activities by model that we encountered in the literature. Um, we did find significant overlap in activities across the three models, as you'll see. We also found significant variation in efficacy across studies for these activities. Um, the activities that were most associated with effective programs included case management uh, services, enhanced surveillance, outreach workers, and public perception campaigns. Um, one thing I just also want to add is we do know that the body of research on this topic is weighted towards certain types of interventions. And so, you know, interventions led by law enforcement and the federal government tend to be more well-funded and have also been the most thoroughly evaluated, um, whereas interventions designed by local non-governmental organizations and public health strategies in particular have been less commonly evaluated. So the available studies that we covered here really don't fully reflect um, the breadth and depth of violence reduction strategies nationwide. Um, and there are definitely a lot of promising strategies out there uh, for reducing violence um, that could be included in this synthesis, could not be included in this synthesis because uh, they just aren't documented in the literature. So ultimately this really uh, helped us understand uh, some of the gaps in the literature and, and where researchers should be looking next. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and pass it to Jesse. Thanks, Lee. And so what I want to do picking up from uh, Lee's presentation is talk quickly about the second uh, primary source uh, that we drew from in creating the practice guidance that we're going to go over with you. And that is uh, the, uh, the scan of practice that we did uh, doing deep dive engagement uh, with 14 anti-violence uh, interventions with different models and different approaches around the country and doing some you know, focused engagement with them over 100 interviews across all of them, wanting to complement what you can get from looking at the, the existing research literature with an understanding of on the ground things and aspects that aren't often fully covered or covered as, as uh, thoroughly in the literature, things around governance, things around funding, things around questions of how different interventions operating in the same cities and even the same neighborhoods interact with one another or not, as is commonly the case, I think in, in many cities where there's a substantial gun violence problem, and also to get a sense of where the innovation and evolution of models in the field stands. I think one of the things that certainly we found in talking to people working with any intervention that had been uh, out in the world for multiple years is that it had changed uh, quite substantially often over the years. And so what might have been captured in a research evaluation at one point in time, the program had continued to grow and learn um, around how to best do the work. So we wanted to use the environmental uh, scan, the scan of practice as an opportunity to capture some of that kind of uh, knowledge that's complementary to uh, the research base. We uh, were out in the field uh, doing this engagement from September of 2020 
to May of 2021. And we're so deeply grateful to all the stakeholders, people in these programs, people who are partners with them that gave so generously of their time during what was a tremendously difficult period because of dealing with the pandemic, because of dealing with um, the mass protests around the country, dealing with you know the great increases in gun violence that uh, many of their communities were experiencing. And they came, you know, I'm thinking about them when Phelan was talking about the level of commitment, you know, the I think the reason that they wanted to give generously of their time is that the idea of gathering knowledge and trying to use that to inform national practice was something that was really important to people. And I think, you know, Lee and I and the entire urban team just hope that, you know, in the work that we did, we uh, we produced something that was worthy of uh, the time that they gave us. Um, as you might imagine, when you're doing this very qualitative deep dive engagement uh, with different communities and interventions, the results are very rich and kind of resist summary, even if we we're going to do nothing but that. But I do want to talk about some of the uh, broad themes that set a good foundation for the practice guidance that we arrived at, and then I'll be uh, talking about first Communities, people working on uh, gun violence issues, youth gun violence issues related to gangs, reported fairly similar drivers of gun violence. In particular, what came up over and over again was the identification that was a relatively small and identifiable number of people and places that was really at the center of the community gun violence problem. This is helpful because although every community is different, it's some of these broad similarities that allow us to think that we have a national practice knowledge base that is worth gathering up in this way and, and providing for the consideration of communities all over the United States. Um, I'd also say around the, the relatively small number of people, another insight uh, about the dynamics of violence that was guiding a lot of these interventions was the understanding that people at high risk of shooting someone and people at high risk of being shot, there was a tremendous amount of overlap, which meant that a lot of the work you were trying to protect people from gun violence and prevent people from committing gun violence. And there was a lot of those were the same people at different points in time. Um, also really key was the work around problem analysis through data and the way that this was suggesting modifications to, to programs. I think there can sometimes be a feeling that perhaps you can skip the problem analysis or you know you can you can move right into action. But I think what we found in engagement with these places is that you know the doing the work of really understanding the problem through data and uh, on the ground insight was generating new knowledge that needed to reshape in some ways what the intervention was. Um, trust building work with the young people at the greatest risk of shooting and being shot was a foundational practice around this, trying to go and build relationships and get at uh, more proactive prevention of violence uh, in that way, again, aided by the fact that it was not an enormous number of people relative to uh, the entire size of the communities. It gave, uh, got it down to a manageable level that you could try and do that relational work in a targeted way. Um, I think one of the key things thinking about uh, which efforts had were law enforcement led, were law enforcement involved, or even had, uh, were entirely uh, community violence interventions with minimal uh, involvement of law enforcement, that, but that the, the police stakeholders that we were talking to really recognized and talked about the importance of partnering with communities and community-based organizations to do anti-violence work, a sense that your you know, toolkit was really incomplete if you were not trying to do anti-violence work in that way. Um, the challenge that comes with that, we'll talk about this more later, is that interventions had to navigate uh, what's often deep mistrust between police and residents of communities where gun violence is concentrated. This was an ongoing and sort of endemic challenge to this uh, uh, collaborative work against violence. And a lot around sustainability and probing into what's necessary in terms of funding, in terms of solid partnerships, in terms of supporting uh, staff of all kinds that are involved in the work and being able to document effectiveness that these were key pillars of sustainability. So as we put these things together, we had uh, a number of areas of practice guidance that we brought forward. They're grouped into nine broad practice areas. And we also thought about them at two levels, one around thinking about infrastructure. What is the kind of infrastructure that you need in a locality to support anti-violence work of all kinds in a coordinated way going beyond 
individual programs and interventions and thinking about all the things that need to be going on to do anti-violence work. And, you know, we found in most places, there's not one thing happening that's tackling this problem. There are many different organizations and efforts. Um, so thinking about what kind of infrastructure supports that work well. And then practice areas around the program level, what were some of the uh, common themes across how to do effective anti-violence work? And, you know, we uh, we did these fairly program model agnostically shared the preponderance of the three main models um, or approaches in the literature. But again, what we found on the ground was a lot of hybridization and a lot of continuity across these models, which uh, I think suggested to us that there is a common practice base. There are some common principles about, about doing anti-violence work. So with that said, I'll try and go reasonably quickly through the nine practice areas to give you a sense of, of what the guidance was and, and open the door for uh, the discussion. Uh, the first practice area, again, around infrastructure was defining the role of government. Um, this is primarily local government, municipal government in coordinating anti-violence work. This is around setting strategy. This is around coordinating different components of a local violence reduction strategy and thinking about how resources are going to be distributed. Many cities obviously have moved in this direction with creating offices of neighborhood safety or violence prevention. And again, if I had to summarize all, across all the parts what this role was, Government has an ability to make sense of the anti-violence practice ecosystem in a place in a way that, you know, other partners cannot on their own and try and create a situation where you can have different kinds of programs. You can have traditional uh, justice agencies and community violence interventions, even if not working in coordination, but working alongside one another as part of a, of a unified um strategy. And I think that strategy point is really critical. One thing I would highlight uh, here, you have a very high level overview of the city of Los Angeles uh, gang reduction and youth development offices, comprehensive strategy. And again, this is work at the city government level of articulating a strategy where pieces like community engagement, prevention, intervention, violence, interruption, how they relate to one another is part of a unified whole, even as each of them is playing their role in the, in the anti-violence work. And there are a number of cities that have that kind of strategic articulation as well. Um, the second practice area is about the resourcing and capacity building is around what's necessary to fund and build the capacity of a robust community based anti violence strategy there are issues here around again like funding at a very basic level but also thinking about expansion of components of that strategy so that they're present wherever the gun violence problem is present around thinking about pay and professionalization across all the different kinds of uh, professions within the anti-violence workforce, street outreach workers, case managers, violence interrupters, and so on, and also supporting them in dealing with uh, the stress and uh, immediate and vicarious trauma that often comes from engaging in anti-violence work that shows up uh, on both the community side and certainly within law enforcement and other system partners as well. One of the things that I would summarize here around the work in this practice area, at the program level, one of the things we heard over and over again is how critical consistency and follow through is in working with young people who are at high risk for involvement in gun violence. And this is really at the infrastructure level about how you make sure the resources are there to allow for that consistency when funding comes and goes, when programs wax and wane in size, when support uh, politically comes and goes, it really undermines the ability uh, of you know, people doing on the ground work to show up with that consistency that they, they you know, are always saying is so important to the work's success. Um, the third practice area was around engaging the community to make and keep the peace. Um, the community engagement strategies people 
uh, all across the country, we're seeing a really foundational for, for doing this work, thinking about how to incorporate community perspectives in building the anti-violence strategy, how to often reflect upward to government uh, agencies of all kinds, what the needs were of the community around uh, reducing gun violence, and also just having community presence and, and active engagement around, around the, the anti-violence work, as well as explaining it and making it clear and present to people what the strategy was and why it was what it was. The next practice area, and this is one that I would say came through certainly from the environmental scan interviews as the most challenging and difficult, is how to calibrate, how to set the relationship between the law enforcement and non-police -com components of the anti-violence work. People describe challenges around trust in all different directions here. Certainly the young people at highest risk of shooting and being shot uh, do not trust uh, the police and may withdraw their trust from anyone that they see communicating and working closely with the police. So if you don't calibrate this right, you can start to undermine the ability of, of street outreach workers and interventionists and violence interrupters to do their work effectively. Um, underlying that was often high levels of mistrust of the police generally among community residents in places where uh, gun violence is concentrated, but also uh, a lot of people describe situations in which the police did not trust a lot of the civilianized anti-violence workers might not trust the violence interrupters or the street outreach workers, uh, particularly since they were often you know, really uh, relying on their lived experience to make them credible messengers engaging with the youth. And, you know, in some places people described a lot of challenge having the police recognize the uh, validity of that profession and also trusting that uh, individuals that were engaged in that um, had, you know, left behind uh, whatever their proximate involvement had been in the dynamics of gun violence. And these are constant challenges to manage pretty much everywhere, no matter how the work is set up. But a lot of it, I think, boils down to setting clear roles and uh, rules of uh, interaction and also having mutual understanding of the work and the contribution that each side makes to it. I think, you know, you see in this first quote, what we heard in a number of different places, actually, was, which is the description of firewalls and communication between uh, workers in community violence interventions and law enforcement saying we're not going to allow certain kinds of uh, communication information flow to go or even interactions because we know that the trust that um, the community violence interventionists are able to bring to this work is foundational to their success and we have to really safeguard that and make sure that we're not undermining it but also I think within that whether you know, these different parts of the anti-violence workforce are working together or just alongside one another, um, an understanding and mutual respect of everybody's role. So with that, from a law enforcement perspective, you have this quote from um, somebody in police who is describing, you know, what happens at, you know, shooting scenes and how critical it is at those high leverage moments that people from the intervention workforce are able to go there and tamp down potential conflicts and engage with family members and people in the community in a way that that law enforcement is uh, not often able to do and how valuable and important that is uh, in their overall strategy to reduce violence. And then the fifth area, I mean, I'm at a research organization, so obviously this is near to dear and near and dear to our hearts is around collecting and sharing data around the intervention and a lot of different ways to do this, but I would say it's got the internal purpose that people talked about, the ability to be self-critical and self-evaluative, to look at what's working well and not in a strategy, to understand that and make improvements um, so that um, the anti-violence work of all kinds is continually getting stronger and learning from experience. And then also for external credibility building, the ability to share and be transparent and make the case through data for what the work is. Again, you have, you know, somebody who responded, um, was part of our environmental scan interview saying, you know, when, when, and this is, you know, somebody who has a lot of confidence in the work they're doing and saying, when we've got the data, it's very hard to say that we're not meeting our goals. 
But when you have no data, it's easy for anyone to say that. So again, like creating both, you know, the ability to improve, but also to make the case for the work was a key part of infrastructure. And again, an important level of government, often what's helpful is to build a data infrastructure to do this, not to require each individual program to do it, but see if you can create the ability for that to be done in a shared way and more globally. Pivoting then to some of the program level ones, and we summarized a lot of practice into four main areas. The first, and I had already mentioned out of the environmental scan is around the problem assessment, doing that work to make sure that you understand the dynamics of local gun violence so that you can focus your attention and resources. That's up front before starting it but often also in an ongoing way through things like shooting reviews. So what you see here is a redacted version of what Stockton does. Each of these uh, red and blue bars is a single group um, within the city and how many shootings that that group has been involved in with as either a suspect or a victim. And they're doing that essentially on a weekly basis to see where the emergent hot conflicts are within that city. And, you know, one of the things that, again, I would say, you know, interventions were telling us, programs are telling us, communities are telling us is, you know, we were learning things from this that were causing us to change how we did our work. And as a very concrete example that put some pressure on the way we even defined our whole project, a lot of them built their work around engaging with a youth gun violence problem. Um, or a youth-driven gun violence problem. And as they were doing these, in some cases, they found that the dynamics there, um, the people who were involved were a lot older than they thought they were. So in concrete examples, we had several interventions were like, you know, we, we topped our eligibility criteria for things at about 25 or 26. But then as we were doing our problem analysis, we were seeing that the average age of people who were uh, shooting suspects or who were being shot was a lot closer to 30. Like the problem was older in the population than we had anticipated. And we had to make some adjustments in our focus based on that. I mentioned, again, from the environmental scan themes, the critical role that building positive relationships to support young people who are at high risk of involvement in gun violence. This is something that was happening in essentially every community, every intervention in some way, shape, or form. Um, there's a whole bunch of things in this uh, practice area, but I think some of the things that we were really focused on was structure to not just have engagement, but to have, whether it was contact standards, but just some clarity about how uh, programs intervention should be working with the youth at what frequency, in what kind of structure to just make sure that it's actually um, clear in that way what that work should look like once you've got uh, the young people that you're trying to work with engaged in programming that you are set up to have consistency and follow through that you're able to be meeting regularly with people to follow through on whatever commitments you're making to them and then also to build in and make sure that the workforce that is doing this has credibility with the community and with the young people they need to reach credible messengers um, in all sorts of different, uh, whether it was doing street outreach, whether it was doing violence interruption, whether it was doing case management was really key here. And one of the reasons you'll see, we're showing here this uh, um, graphic that the Gang Reduction Initiative of Denver was using to articulate their coordinated service delivery system. I talked about the tight focus on youth at highest risk, but many of the programs, many of the interventions, many of the communities we were looking at, I mean, they were doing intervention, they were doing prevention, they were doing interaction with youth with a variety of relationships to risk, and that's great and really important. Part of what's important, though, is then to have service path differentiation to make sure that you know who your prevention youth are and who your intervention youth are, that there are separate service pathways that you can tell who's in which and that you're working with them differently and not uh, mixing those groups together. Um, the interruption and mediation of conflicts was uh, a fundamental attribute of anti-violence work across uh, the communities and the interventions that we were looking at. I think what I would say in summary here is, there's a proactive element to this about mediating conflicts, about having uh, outreach workers and interventionists out making connections, uh, understanding the community, building trust, or you know keeping in constant uh, connection with what's going on. 
out in the community. And then there's the response element rolling out when there's been a shooting, doing that very active in the moment work of violence interruption and trying to prevent one shooting through retaliatory cycles from turning into another or three or four. And simply to say, the reason I mentioned these together is as people are describing them, these work really hand in glove. It's that proactive work and making sure that you're set up to do that. You've been building the relationships and understanding that gives you the foundation to then do that effective response work. So these are these are two parts of that, um, that conflict uh, mediation and interruption. And then the final one uh, area is around suppression and enforcement. And one of the things that a lot of the law enforcement respondents uh, talked about here is in engaging in good anti-violence work, doing a little bit of a frame shift away from thinking about doing a lot of broad enforcement activity as being um, an effective way of doing anti-violence work and then thinking about something that is much more targeted and also coupled with the positive engagement so that you are always combining use of suppression and enforcement when you have to with positive pathways for young people at risk to be able to reduce that risk and uh, move away from potential involvement in gun violence uh, to make sure that whatever you're doing here is very focused so that you're not doing a lot of broad-based enforcement in neighborhoods where gun violence is concentrated, creating an additional burden um, on the vast majority of people living there who have no involvement in, in gun violence and sowing more of the mistrust um, that makes uh, collaboration on this work so challenging. And also to make sure that what you're doing is proactively communicating to people that are at high risk of being a victim of gun violence, but also being subject to enhanced enforcement, that that is the case, what their options are and how that fits into an overall strategy uh, to try and protect them. So hopefully this has uh, made you interested in going into the deeper dive where we elaborate on all of these things and helps open the door for uh, the panel discussion. Um, it's a lot of ground to cover. It's a tremendously rich and challenging and complex area of practice. Here you see the uh, links to the publications that we have from here if you want uh, to do the reading. And I want to just say thank you to the National Gang Center and all the partners involved uh, for letting us share this work. We hope it's useful and additive and impactful and looking forward to the discussion. So I'll pass it off to you, Mina. Thank you. Thank you, Jesse. And Jesse and Lee, you provided a wealth of information in just a short, in just a short time frame. So I would encourage viewers to visit the Urban Institute's uh, website to access the, the guidance, the practice guidance, and then the supporting documentation behind it. So now we're going to move on to our panel discuss discussion. And Jesse, please, please stay on with us. I want to introduce our next guests, Victor Gonzalez Jr. and Eric Jones. So Victor, Gonzal Victor Gonzalez Jr. has more than 30 years of experience working with high-risk youth, including 25 years spent working directly with youth and adults involved with Houston, Texas area gangs. He currently serves as the division manager for the mayor's office of gang prevention and intervention in Houston, Texas. He also works as a consultant throughout the city of Houston, the state of Texas, and the United States on gang intervention and prevention strategies dealing with gangs, female gangs, and how to conduct gang outreach. Eric Jones is the Deputy County Executive for the Public Safety and Justice at Sacramento County, California, and was appointed by the Sacramento County Board of Supervisors in February 2022. He has almost 30 years of public service experience and most recently served as police chief for the Stockton Police Department since 2012 until his retirement in December 2021. As the chief of police, he transformed Stockton's policing practices through innovative strategies and community engagement um, efforts. So let's start with our panel discussion, our panel questions. And, and I encourage, I encourage uh, our audience and our viewers to uh, put your questions in the, in the Q&A section or in the general chat. And if we can't get to them now, this time, we will address them 
um, during our Ask the Expert session that follows in two weeks, I believe it's two weeks. So the first question, a problem analysis is critical and, and a fundamental building block of each of the comprehensive approaches that are outlined in this guidance is Jesse really, really drove home with his presentation. So Eric, let's, let's begin with you. If your community engaged was engaged in a local problem analysis, how did that impact the structure and selection of the strategies for the violence reduction initiative that's going on now? Sure, thank you uh, for having me and uh, great to be here. So uh, with my experience in Stockton, it really began in 2012. Uh, that's when I became police chief there. And we had a record amount of uh, gun violence uh, and specifically homicides. We had 71 homicides, which for a city the size of Stockton, which is just a little over 300,000, is an extremely large rate. Uh, and we found, you know, eventually uh, that it was re mostly retaliatory violence um, between, and, and there was a great discussion about groups versus gangs versus sets versus crews. I mean, even these individual group, or these individuals in groups that were committing the violence were calling themselves uh, different names. And we found actually the same gangs were warring with each other um, with subsets. So bottom line was our problem analysis alone that we were doing our data was not sufficient and we had to really determine what is best real time we could get what was really occurring on the streets you know you've got the police crime reports and the data but it does not tell the full story so we had to better engage um, with the community meanwhile we had to to uh in, as police chief i had to navigate the political waters meaning you know various elected officials uh wanted something right now wanted to rush into some certain strategies that i i think could have um, put even greater barriers up um, worse barriers up between us and, and community and so as mentioned earlier it to to slow things down enough to you know react but but not rush into a strategy that could be harmful to the community and, and begin a comprehensive approach so uh, we did engage the community to participate in our problem analysis. And we, we also found sort of like what Jesse said is, uh, I think there was a, an idea that the youth were driving our violence. In that particular case, it wasn't. It, it was pretty much guys in their 20s and 30s. Um, so to get that problem analysis helped me because data typically doesn't lie. Um, and so, but also, you know, coupling that with the community telling us what's going on within their neighborhoods, we were able to sort of cut through the politics and the opposing rhetoric, if you will. And uh, we, we were leveraged our partners with commu uh, our community leaders. So what that did is that focused our strategies. We stopped doing just blanket um, sweeps, uh, sweeping entire neighborhoods getting just a whole lot of arrests, um, and which is sort of sometimes what elected officials want, want to see, but to, to not do that and be very much more precisely focused in the real small percentage that were driving the violence. Um, so what we found, again, based on community input was we had to restructure the way we as a police department uh, focused on gun violence we did stand up and create an Office of Violence Prevention, which I know a lot of cities and counties have. We did not at the time. And we had to better work with our law enforcement um, and community partners. And I would just say the one thing I really learned when we worked with our academic partners, our data, our problem analysis with community, is that trust building between police and community is directly related to violent crime, especially gun crime. Um, I kind of knew it intuitively, but the data later showed it for me. So, so you bring up a couple of points and, and knowing, knowing it into your last point, knowing it, knowing it intuitively, that's very important because so many of us and so many of the different stakeholders, the different players, the different community members, uh, uh, you know, politicians, everyone, they sort of, they know something about the violence that's happening in their community intuitively, but the data brings everybody on the same page. Thank you, thank you for that. Victor, I pose the same question to you. 
So I know the first comprehensive gang assessment in Houston was conducted in the early 2000s, but since then there's been a number of approaches to gathering and addressing data and using evidence to guide the mayor's office initiatives. So tell us how problem analysis has guided and impacted the structure and selection of program strategies for you. Thank you, Mina. And it's an honor to be here and speaking to everybody today. And thank you guys for joining. Uh, you know, I was listening to Eric speak and, you know, he comes from the law enforcement perspective and I come from the gang outreach perspective, working the streets before I even became part of this office. And when they introduced the comprehensive gang model, I was kind of, what is this? Why are we having this? These people don't know the city and you want to put it in my neighborhood where I grew up, where I know everybody and everything, and this ain't going to work. And being a youngster in my 30s, watching that, having that mindset and not really understanding research and data and really not understanding strategies at the nonprofit level, it was hit the street, find out who's causing all the drama and let's go, right? No data, no research. When, when I came here to the office, the introduction of the model really gave me a base or a foundation in which to work from that has driven the way we do things here in the office. Uh, because I think the, the biggest thing is, is that my outreach workers need to know where they're going, what they're going to do and how we're going to do it, what works and what doesn't, because you have to be able to kind of change with the times. Uh, research, you know, sometimes I learned through our process was that the data that we were looking at and the analysis that we were conducting uh, during the time that they were doing it here, by the time we hit implementation, it had changed. So you may have thought that this population was creating all the all the violence and then immediately it was like that's not the case a year and a half later you know sometimes two years later when you're talking about implementation because you can't get everybody to play ball you can't get all the agencies to work together uh, some cities don't want to admit that you have an issue and so sometimes getting through those kind of challenges and obstacles can kind of slow down or even speed up some things that we needed to do so here in houston i had to learn who else do i need to work with here um, when I started looking at the, the model, the conference of gang model, the intervention team was something that I really took to. And I'll have a small team here. At most, we'll have 10, 12 people. To do the work is very difficult uh, with the, the magnitude of the city, 2 million people. So being able to look at the data and look at where we're at, we're able to identify the specific areas that match up with what we're seeing on the streets. And that's consistent with years and years and years of doing the work. And I think once we were able to put those things together, the one thing that I really took from the model was a strategy the intervention team. And I created four. And you've got to bring a lot of people together. So there's a lot of work, a lot of maintenance to pull this thing off. But it was the only way I was going to be able to keep up with what we were seeing. Because not all parts of the city are going to be at that same pace for violence. Um, they have peaks and valleys. Some are more and more... Um, engaged for a longer period of time. And some of them you get involved with all the different strategies from law enforcement, criminal justice, the DA's office, and the outreach workers. When all that is rolling together and you're doing good work and you can pull different levels, uh, levers, I've noticed how quickly a reduction can happen. But you have to be able to keep up with the times, with the, with the, the statistics. You have to have people in place to be able to do that. You have to have champions in your city to be able to make sure that these things are continuously moving because the research will show that things change dramatically over a period of time. Uh, never did I think we were going to have to modify so greatly with COVID. We had to modify how we did anything with our kids now, and we're still working out of that, out of that issue uh, to modify our services. So keeping up with the information is very, very crucial. If I don't have that information and I don't understand that as a practitioner, especially me coming from the streets and having to slowly graduate in my 50s now where I'm like, you have to use this. This is something you may not have liked in your 30s. But as I've gotten older, I understand the magnitude and the need for it so that we're not just everywhere and anywhere and not really doing much of anything. Uh, you, that, that causes a lot of stress for my outreach workers and for people in any city that's trying to tackle this, this gang violence reduction initiative. Thank you. Thank you. And, and in talking about that, you know, one of the other things that, that I've heard you talk about in the past, you know, because of this data and because of being on the same page and having this focus, you've been able to, to make it through um, more than one mayor's administration. <laughs> it's uh, quite a few actually now over the past uh, 10 or 15 or so years. And, and so that is also uh, an issue that, that gets everybody on the same page and 
and um, that data, then that problem analysis and that ability to have that agility to move back and forth so quickly. So um, Jesse, do you have any comments in hearing what you're, what you're hearing from our two panelists, our two other panelists? I mean, I, I think the one thing, and maybe this is picking up on uh, one of the questions in the Q and A, although it wasn't directed to me. I, I think one of the things that I would just want to emphasize here is that, in a lot of places, certainly in Stockton, this was the case. This is work that was ongoing, so it's not that you do a problem analysis once and you're done. But also, this is part of operational collaboration. In some places, actually, the structure that this had also speaks to the question about how to. Um, you know, get uh, police buy-in for community violence interventions, which is you're doing on an ongoing way, the work of talking about what are the shootings that happened this week or the past couple of weeks? And what does this tell us about where we need to be? And so sometimes you can't get them to slow down. And some of the insights were from problem analyses that actually happened after some things were out in the field and required course correction. But this is an ongoing, like, process of collaborative learning in a lot of places and figuring out where you need to be. And so that can create greater trust and collaboration. And there's also a way in which it's never too late. You really should do the problem analysis first and then roll stuff out, right. but that's not always how that has happened out in the world. Yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. And, I, and I'm glad you brought up the point about, you know, using that to slow things down um, a, a little bit. We're getting some outstanding questions <laughs> and, and I'm sort of eyeballing them out of the corner of my eye and I won't go back to them yet. I want to move on with the questions, with the panel questions that we have. And then I think some of these may be addressed as we continue to speak. So let's move on to the next, to the next question. So Community advocacy and engagement in violence reduction are other focuses of, of the guidance. And authentic community buy-in and a sense of ownership by community members, that's critical to the success of any violence reduction initiative. And all of you have already um, touched on that in, in, in uh, your presentations and your answers. So community members must feel like they have you know, a seat at the table and that they have a voice for, that they are part of the voice for positive change. So Victor, how have you incorporated community into your local efforts? I think for us, it's been, you know, for years, it's really important to me that at least with, with our staff, when we're out and whenever I'm out in the community, people need to know who we are. So, you know, with our work, we've really put ourselves right where we need to be. You know, the model calls for you to be able to um, impact the most gang impacted areas. And that means you've got to put yourself in there with those kids, with those adults, with those families, those places, those schools, apartment complexes, parks. You've got to put yourself out there first and foremost. And when you can put literature out about understanding what the office is doing and what services we provide, that kind of already starts to set the foundation for who you are. So that in the event that we have a major shooting or a major uh, issue in a certain area, typically what will happen is the police department here will take the lead uh, because there's an investigation and I stay out of the way. That's what they do. We have a we have a clear understanding of who's going to engage in the community first. And behind the scenes, we're doing a lot of work because a lot of times the shootings that are taking place, it's not uncommon for us to know the suspect and the victim or know the gangs that are going at it in any in any area. So for us, we're going behind the scenes to make sure we're engaging our schools, uh, the park directors, wherever things are happening, we have to make sure that we're we're pulling them together and really trying to figure out what's going on so we can slow that situation down. Uh, with law enforcement, they trust that we're going to do what we got to do to to put the word out and be that credible messenger, that outreach worker that we're called here to really be the one that's clearing up some of the information that may be going on because a lot of times information goes out bad, and if it goes out wrong to the community the gangs can take it and run with it and it's not even actually accurate or true. So sometimes us being out there when those things are happening, it's important for us to be there. When we get into town hall meetings, when we get into, uh, there's some things I'm looking at here with our assistance, assistance office that I wanna have some discussions about, about bringing the community, um, doing some pop-up meetings just around gangs uh, so that we can have a better understanding from them 
what is going on. I have an understanding, but it's nothing like when it comes back from the community. So you have to engage. So getting out there and being in front of folks is, is of the utmost importance if you're going to do this work, because that's the only way you're going to gain trust. They got to be able to talk to somebody. Uh, and if it's one person that can navigate the way I can navigate here because of where I work, then that makes it a little bit easier for us to be where we need to be and incorporate the community. Right. So, so, you know, when I hear you speaking, you're talking about the credibility, your the credibility of you, your staff getting out there, speaking, speaking with school members, community members, faith, faith leaders, um, and, and, and listening to them and giving them the respect and, and, and the, um, authentication and then they're the credible messengers back to you in that sense of communicating back and forth. So um, Eric, I pose the same question to you. Have you as part of your career in the field as well as your specific work now, how have you incorporated community into your local efforts? Sure, and th this actually ties back into something uh, uh, I mentioned about intuitively, I thought traditional policing wasn't work, working. Um, you know, I did, I did nearly 30 years in Stockton. I did uh, uh, many years in the early 90s um, doing traditional policing. And this is when, uh, you know, violence was very high. It was um, sort of the, the war on drugs. Uh, mm -hmm. Policing across the nation was addressing it a certain way that led to mass, uh, added to mass incarceration. I knew it wasn't working. But it's what we were tasked to do. So then, you know, fast forward later, uh, we're grappling with violence again, uh, serious gun violence, and we're still using a traditional model. And uh, it is actually the work we ended up doing that is hard work, and it, it takes it takes a lot of stakeholders a long time to really get the work driven in the right direct in the correct direction. It was community led. So actually, we had several um, very active uh, community groups that came to myself and the mayor and said, we need to do something different. And that's when we, be, we began to scan for best practices and working with the community. We, you know, we knew we couldn't do it alone. We knew they couldn't do it alone. So it really informed our, our change, complete change in strategy. Uh, and I would say we, I knew we needed a consistent message. So we all know a lot of organizations um, and it, it's across the board, sometimes work in silos, sometimes don't even um, aren't aligned in exactly where they're coming from. And this could be criminal justice agencies, uh, government, community-based organizations, uh, everybody. So the first thing we had to do is what is our consistent basic message? The gun violence has to stop. I mean, everybody can agree with that. If not, they don't get a seat at the table, right, for this work. And then it came down to, look, we need safer communities while also reducing negative outcomes in our criminal justice system. Um, so we worked together a lot. And again, it took time. We had to build trust on both sides. Um, so you have to move, you know, swiftly, but while, but, but at, at a certain pace where no one's getting ahead of their skis um, and, and that we're incorporating and bringing everybody together. Uh, and we knew that we police weren't going to always be the most credible messengers in the community, right? So that, that's why our uh, custom notifications and call-ins as we've, we've had, they're really community led um, that we're just bridging that gap uh, with them. So I'll just shift over quickly to something we did to really incorporate community voice that, that I was very proud of. So we developed out of our Office of Violence Prevention what we call the Leadership Council. These are the pretty much the guys that we were uh, most at risk of being shot or, or um, shooting someone that the Office of Violence Prevention was able to reach out to, and they were ready for, for a change, a positive change course. We developed a leadership council where, where myself and other leaders in the city would listen to them. They hold the seats at the council and they tell us what they think uh, our community needs, what they think policing should look like. Uh, we actually shaped up some policy changes based on hearing from these guys. Um, examples are, hey, the way you do those you know, gang sweeps or the way you search my house just because I'm on probation or parole. Um, you know, we, we took their input and listened and partnered with them because we both found in the long run we wanted to reduce gun violence. That, that's an excellent example. And I think that, that we will be getting a lot more questions 
as to finding out more of, about uh, these practices and the leadership council that you've created. So just the, in your research and in your um, environmental scan of the, um, of the, uh, uh, all these different sites and looking at this material, do, does, do any other examples or, or, or areas um, come to mind as far as, you know, addressing, uh, incorporating community into local efforts? I mean, I think one of the, just one of the things that I would add is, you know, and this is maybe articulated particularly one way within focused deterrence uh, interventions, but is, you know, incorporating the voice of the community and making moral claims on folks that might be at risk of being involved in gun violence and messaging to them that it's not that the community values them, but needs them to stop you know, just needs them to collectively pull back from the violence. And one of the things that I think is important there is, you know, the idea, and, and in a way this ties into, you know, Eric's example, which I think is really powerful, which is recognizing that whether it's folks who may be gang involved or just really at high risk for involvement in gun violence, they also are members of the community and care about the community and you know that that those feelings um, are a potentially powerful way of engaging them in thinking about what anti-violence strategy should be and so like engaging with them as community members which is something that I think often community violence interventions do much more naturally than uh, than than uh, than government systems. Mm. Yeah, that's a lived experience. So let, why don't we move on to the next question? I, I wanna make sure that we have enough time uh, to address all of this and perhaps some of the other, some of the panel questions. So the next question, the guidance emphasizes the relationship between law enforcement and non-law enforcement anti-violence work. And in a lot of ways, you've already, you've already addressed this, the three of you in, in what, what you're talking um, what you're talking about. So Victor, I'll start with you. What does this dynamic look like in Houston? You've had, you know, and, and you've had years of experience to navigate community trust issues um, in, in this area. It, it takes a lot of work. I, I think here for me, you know, probably the biggest thing that I, I have here is that I've been here a long time. So I'm, I'm pushing 24 years here in this office but 30 plus 35, 36 years in the community. And so being able to have that, that people know me as that's the gang man, that's the gang guy, right? And so being able to look at law enforcement early on, they didn't like me and I like them. I'll just be frank, back in the nineties, they didn't like what I was doing early on when I was doing this work. They didn't understand the work. It was zero tolerance on gangs in our city. Um, it took a long time to, for me to be able to prove that what we were doing makes an impact and that we were on the right side of the fence because sometimes unfortunately with our work and the profession profession that we're in, sometimes across the country, we need to be careful as gang outreach workers, violence interrupters, those folks are in the streets. We need to make sure that we stay um, on the right side of the fence when we do this work. We can't have one foot in, one foot out. I think that for me, just from the outreach perspective and really how we were being accepted by law enforcement we had to show what we were about and that we were legitimate about how we were providing services. Even when we're doing community events, I've done things like where I had one gang play event against the gang unit from that area. And those were the gang officers that were supervising, that were patrolling them. I did a softball game and they were separate. It was the gang versus the unit. And it's nothing more hilarious than to watch a kid run around the bases with an ankle monitor on and then he messes around and gets tagged out at home and gets upset because the sergeant that's over the gang unit tagged him out. Sometimes going back to basics and really doing some community events. I've done three on three basketball tournaments with the referees or our officers. They're not in uniform, they're in plain clothes, uh, utilizing some of the prevention and intervention components uh, in the departments where we have PAL and great, utilizing those officers to be able to make sure that when we're putting on events and we're doing the work, that we're trying to change the way people look at law enforcement because you know the media doesn't help the YouTube and all the social media outlets and technology that the kids have 
at their hands today at their disposal really can give a, a really distorted view of, of a person. And that's whether it's law enforcement or whether it's an outreach worker or a program. The way we say things and the things that we do are very crucial in how we're modeling uh, for the community because they're watching what you're doing. And so a lot of times, even in our work, we're trying to get them to understand that not all officers are that way. Not the way you see it. That's not how it goes down. You know, there's some responsibility we have. We, we'll introduce kids on school campuses. Have you met your school officer? You know, it's a matter of you being able to educate the community and in our world, the youth and the young adults, that they're not always what you think. They're just as human as anybody else. But, you know, they're there to hold people accountable. And we have to make sure that on our end, when we're providing services, that we're letting the, letting the families and the, and the youth know that are engaged in this stuff as they're part of the community. Breaking the law is not OK. Shooting another person is not OK. Uh, it's one of those things that we have to constantly be working on. So there's a lot of education that has to go on. And, and you can have it at a high level. You can use the media or you can break it down straight to the streets and make this thing work itself out. But you have to have somebody help you navigate. And that's, I think, where these outreach programs, these intervention programs really can help mitigate and maybe even, even bridge gaps. We do a lot of bridging gaps here in Houston. That's what I try to do here because it's important for us. We all have to work together to reduce violence. There's no way around it. I can't do it by myself. And the cops are not going to arrest their way out of it. So it's not one of those things that's going to happen where if you're not working together, you're going to be, it's going to be a slow process for you to get things under control. Yeah. Yeah. I'm hearing from, from everything that all of you, that the two of you are saying, I'm hearing themes from the practice areas that Jesse, um, you know, elaborated on in his presentation and, and, you know, the focus on, on data, incredibly important, the lived experiences, incredibly important. And when we get to, when we start talking about lived experiences and community members and, and those, it's, it's, it's everyone, right? No one should be excluded. And I'm, you know, that's a major message right now. So, and when I say er everyone, Eric, I'm going to uh, pose a question to you. You know, it's really, it, my opinion, when we recognize that we recognize law enforcement as an integral component of community, rather than something external to community, just like we recognize, we should be recognizing, you know, people returning from incarceration as not external to the community, but part of the community. So, you know, it's hard work and both of you have talked about it's hard work and the different things, the different approaches in your cities of how you've had to address this building of the relationships of trust. So what, what does this relationship dynamic look? And you've already spoken some about it, but just, just keep, <laughs> keep providing us these, um, these insightful examples of what you're doing. Uh, uh, and, and I'm talking about the dynamic of the uh, relationship between law enforcement and those involved in non-policing components of the anti-violence work. Sure, thanks. So uh, I'm gonna just kind of talk about trust building efforts, but then I will wanna drill down into the actual relationship um, between you know, police officers and uh, you know, what I'll call our outreach workers right, who most of our outreach workers have been involved um, in some way in, in a lot of the, these uh, group dynamics and now want to uh, be involved in reducing violence. What we found that trust building efforts, um, it, we, the bottom line is we need to show police are part of our community, not apart from our community. Basic peeling principles, uh, just as um, relevant today if not ever. And so that's about us not looking like or appearing like we are in, uh, just enforcers and we're an occupying force within neighborhoods. Uh, we know true policing has to have uh, the community's voice in how they want to be policed and how we do our work within their communities. So we've done a lot of things, for example, very courageous, we call them courageous conversations, uh, where we bring community and officers together in workshops where they really get to have these very uh, uh, difficult but needed conversations, and, and but also begin to look through one another's lenses as well. So you might have a community member saying, hey, when your police car is behind me and you pull me over, here's why I am so fearful. And then you might have the officer explaining at the same table, and these are so powerful when you're a part of these 
uh, conversation saying, you know, also when I'm pulling somebody over, I don't know if this is the last traffic stop I'll ever do and I, if I return back to my family. And what, what this does is it really uh, uh, turns into a very powerful conversation. And we've also done what's known as racial reconciliation, which can be a, a, work, a workshop or, or a seminar of its own. Um, but it was really us acknowledging to the community, me first, then my officers over time, that look, we understand police are in the position of power and that there's, there are very painful, um, real things that police have done across the country over the years, which is why there's so much distrust in our communities of color. And so by making those acknowledgements, we found that gets us into some um, very uh, meaningful dialogue around those issues. So going to the relationship between our police and our outreach workers, who are sometimes called violence interrupters, or it's a little bit different, right, in, in different cities. Uh, for us, we actually call them peacekeepers. And again, those are our outreach workers. Just like Victor said, um, when we began the program, I mean, being candid, they didn't really trust one another. They didn't really understand one another's roles, right? And so it might be at a shooting scene and the officers are, you know, doing what, what they do is investigate, keep people out of the crime scene. The outreach workers are like trying to talk to family. What they're trying to do is, is stop further retaliation. Everybody had the same goal, but they're coming from different places. And it's once our outreach workers sort of realized and that this relationship develops over time. Once they really began to understand what the peacekeepers outreach workers role is, um, and also that they have to maintain credibility in the community and can't look like agents of the police. There has to be a separation or they won't have that, that credibility out there. Um, so it, it really was over time, a lot of conversations, but then that also that trust was built over time. Um, very similar to what Victor said is when the officers began to see, oh, whoa, they, okay, we've been around these guys for a number of years now and we see they're actually making change with some of these guys out here. Um, and so it really turned into what's a, a, a much more positive relationship now. Right. It's, it takes time. I mean, that's, 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 what, that's what we see from the National Gang, uh, National Gang Center perspective and us working with dozens and dozens of communities and community projects over the years on, on these issues of youth violence reduction, gang redu youth gang reduction. It, it takes time, it takes that clear communication, it takes that, that focus on data, that building of relationships, that, that community empowerment. And so I believe that all of you have um, really driven that home with your, with your experiences and your you know, retelling of, of what you have seen over, um, through your work. So we have, we have a few more minutes and I am just seeing out of the corner of my eye just dozens of questions coming in and I'm just delighted to see them all. We can barely get to any of them. I'm trying to um, catch some themes as I scroll through these. And um, if we don't, I just wanna remind you that if we don't get to, if we haven't answered your questions, we do want to uh, invite you back in two weeks to our Ask, Ask the Expert session because um, this really does need a deeper dive. It's a, it's a complicated issue. It took a long time, you know, violence, it's taken a long time or, or festered over a long time and it's going to take a, take a while to, to really address these problems uh, effectively. But one of the things I'm seeing, and so I'm going to ask because we just have a minute, some of the things, some of the themes that I'm seeing and the questions coming up are around uh, the issues of fear in the community around, you know, the violence that needs to be addressed and uh, buy-in, buy-in, how do you get, how do you get the gang members bought in? How do you get, how do you get <laughs> police buy-in? How do you get local uh, government leadership buy-in. And that in itself, I don't think you could answer in 30 seconds as I, as I reach out to all of you. But if each of you has one last word or one last point you wanna make around, around those, those topics or just, just a final point to round this up, I will um, I'll give it over to you. Jess, Jesse, you wanna start? 
Sure, I'll I'll pick up on the theme, and I saw this around around government buy in, and I think there was one question that was about getting off of grants and onto permanent, more permanent funding for the the community based parts of these strategies, and I would say. One huge advantage now is the ability that we have to speak about the effectiveness and what this work can look like at really high quality is has advanced so much over the years because of the local level work that folks have been putting in. And I think the question for government, which has been more receptive to this now, is if this is a serious part of your anti-violence strategy, then you know that's got to be budget line item like anything else. Like you wouldn't let your entire police department be dependent on like whether you had a police department or how big it was every year being dependent on grant funding decisions. So why, if you know CVIs and that part of the work is fundamental to your strategy, would you uh, would you accept that? Okay, thank you, Victor. To, to all those gang outreach programs that are out there, all those programs that are out there on the streets, you're doing what you're doing. You know, always, always pay respect to those groups that have been around a long time. You know, you've, you've set a precedence about what we need to be doing in the communities. And there's a lot to be learned, even though it may not always get recognized. There's a lot of things that you've done and you've set the standard. For those that have been coming up behind us, old guys, you know, those veteranos, those, those OGs of the work, you know, you youngsters that are coming up, listen to what we got to say. And as old heads, we got to remember, as veteranos, the veterans out there, we've got to listen to the young, the young people coming up. There's a different, it's a different world now with our gangs. Things have changed so much. And it's important to me that you understand that as we move forward, you're not alone in the work. You don't have to do it by yourself, but you're going to have to open up your mind a little bit uh, to be able to understand the roles of other agencies. Because at the end of the day, you're going to be more efficient and more productive when you have the right partnerships to be able to help the young people that, that so badly need us. Because when we ain't around, you know what it is on the streets. Where you at? Where you been? You know, I come, I ain't seen you. Trust is a big issue with our communities and those kids and gangs. When you're not around anymore, it, it, things can change. So hats off to you. Keep doing the work. But remember, we got to open up. We got to professionalize this thing. We need to let people know that in this work, we're important. We're the eyes, the ears, and we're the heart of all the work that we do in the community. So, you know, stay above the ground, do what you got to do. But man, we got to we got to change up the way we do things. And so sometimes you got to open up your mind. So good luck to you. And it was a pleasure being here today. Thank you so much, Victor. Eric? Thanks. Very similar. But the question, I guess, would be how have I been able to to change some folks' paradigm on uh, these things. And I just, I say it's the heart and the mind because it's what worked for me. By the heart, I mean, we need to hear the stories of those impacted. Um, and so, and I've developed relationships with, with a lot of uh, community leaders that way. And then through the mind, which is through data, right? We have to be data informed and make sure we're developing problem analysis that really guide our, our strategies. And I would just say this to law enforcement jurisdictions, cities, counties, whomever, I've always said this, it does not matter what your staffing is. It does not matter what your budget is. Trust me, we did it when the city of Stockton was going through bankruptcy. It's, are you making it a priority? Um, are you making reducing gun violence and trust building a priority? No matter staffing and budget, you, can, you will find a way to do it that's sustainable. Thank you so much. Eric Jones, Victor Gonzalez, Jesse Janetta, Lee Courtney, Phelan Weirich, thank you so much. To our viewer, viewers, I would say, Please hang on for two more minutes. I am going to turn it over to my colleague, Sterling Stremmel, who will uh, close out for us. Thank you all for joining such a great discussion today. So as we close out, I just wanted to remind everyone there are several funding opportunities available through OJJDP as well as other OJP offices to support the type of work we were talking about today. And that can be found on the following website, which was posted earlier in the session. So as a reminder, we've discussed this, there will be a follow-up Ask the Expert session on May 11th with Mr. Victor Gonzalez to dive deeper into some of your specific audience questions, concerns, challenges related to establishing or strengthening violence reduction efforts in your community. So this session is intended for those individuals or organizations actively engaged in gang group and gun violence reduction efforts. So you should have already received the confirmation details for this event. And we ask that you submit your questions in advance, either using the form provided in the chat now, which will also be emailed out after the event. 
Um, and so again, we also invite you, if you did have any questions that were not addressed today, you can submit those for the following Ask the Expert session, or if you're in need of any other resources, you can reach out to the National Gang Center at our email and website. Um, as for future virtual learning opportunities arise through the National Gang Center, we will notify you all of those via email. And so as we close out today, we would just invite you all to please submit your feedback from the session. It should just take a few minutes. You can complete that by using the link that I just provided in the chat or scanning the QR code here on this slide with your phone. The survey is completely anonymous and provides incredibly valuable information to guide our work. If you would like to receive a certificate from this event, we ask that you complete this survey and upon completion, you will be directed to a form where you can request your certificate. And we will leave this link open for a few minutes so that you can take the time to complete the survey. So again, I would just like to thank everyone for joining us and for this great discussion and especially the great engagement from the audience. As I said, we will try to address these questions during our follow-up session, but if we cannot, please feel free to reach out to the National Gang Center. So with that, this will now conclude our session for the webinar today. I hope you all have a great afternoon and take care. Thank you.